Thank you. Thank you for the uh, introduction. I just had a, a really great conversation with a number of students. Hopefully some of you are, are in here. Is anyone in here that I was talking to? Yeah. Okay, good. <clears throat> so I have a lot to cover, um, and so I'm going to speak really fast um, so that we have time to continue that kind of conversation afterwards. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, sort of the relationship between uh, politics, power, and urban design, um, and sort of the impact that that can have on communities if done correctly and if understood correctly, uh, the positive impact that you can have in cities. <clears throat> so cities evolve through a complex layering and relayering of projects, processes, and politics. In my talk this evening, I will give a brief overview of urban development in the US, sort of highlighting some of these power structures as they developed in cities, and explore the interrelationship of urban politics and urban design in a single project, one of the projects that was mentioned, Uptown Cincinnati, as a way to understand how urban development happens with particular focus on the social and political implications of the process. Operationally speaking, urban planning establishes high-level parameters and strategic direction for cities with legal, political, and geographically broad tools like zoning, land use, linkages, finance, and community benefits. Though powerful, these tools remain mostly blunt and un unable to deal with the intricacies and nuances of site. Architecture, on the other hand, is the harmonious orchestration of structures, systems, materials, and programs on a particular site. Buildings are meant to be sturdy, functional, and visually inspiring, but they remain mostly deferential to the planning frameworks within which they are designed, only able to push back nominally through transformative devices such as getting variances or height or density bonuses as stipulated by the legal planning frameworks that precede them. Urban design is at the same time both planning and architecture, and neither planning nor architecture. So how does urban design operate in cities? Responding to a perceived split in design and planning in his 1942 book, Can Our City Survive?, Jose Luis, Luis Sert outlined what he saw to be the primary issues, interplays, and interdependencies of the city as dwelling, recreation, work, transportation, and large-scale planning, none of which were being adequately addressed by design or planning alone. So Sert conceptualized of a town planner as a special coordinator between design and planning as either a subset of planning or a common ground for architecture, landscape architecture, and planning. In 1956, Sert later clarified his view of urban design as an aesthetic synthesis of architecture, landscape architecture, and planning as a way to lay claim to the design professionals, uh, the, to the design professionals, the intellectual and practical territory around problems of urbanism. And he urged that attendees of the first urban design conferences at Harvard set out to establish a broad set of principles for this new special coordinator he called the town planner. Over time, urban design at Harvard became more centered on architecture than the other aspects of design, and the roles of landscape and planning were greatly diminished in favor of the architect. Even as late as the 10th Urban Design Conference at Harvard in 1966, most in attendance claimed that urban design was big architecture, with a notable ex exception of Willow von Mulk, who was the sitting chair of urban design at the time, and he stated that urban design is not architecture, the function of urban design, its purpose and objective, is to give form and order to the future. Contrasted with big ar architecture, urban design is process-driven rather than outcomes-driven. Thus, it is critical for urban designers to understand how and why decisions are made if they hope to have any real agency. A beautiful design that does, does not resonate with the momentum of a political movement an economic bottom line or a social imperative is doomed to be nothing more than an image. That is not to say that designers should be complicit in their work, nor that meaningful design should not also be beautiful. Rather, that urban designers need to be savvy in the understanding of the context in which they work and be able to negotiate between ideals and the realities of that urban context. In this way, urban design is the harmonious balance of an aesthetic expression, political process, and an accumulation of values that reflect the environment, the environmental, social, and economic needs of a city's inhabitants in meaningful ways. In his paper, Meaningful Urban Design, Teleological, Catalytic, and Relevant, Asim Inam describes urban design in the architectural tradition as an over-eagerness to be unconventional and spectacular, and that it is often taught and practiced as an aesthetic, morphological, novel, and superficial exercise. 
He goes on to say that unfortunately, most of the recent interest in urban design repeats the familiar deficiencies of the past. A focus on the superficial aspects and the picturesque aspects of cities instead of the role that, say, aesthetics play in community development processes. An overemphasis on the architect as urban designer and an obsession with design instead of more profound interdisciplinary approaches to addressing fundamental causes. An understanding of urban design primarily as a finished product instead of an ongoing long-term process intertwined with social and political mechanisms and a pedagogical process that is comfortably rooted in architecture and design rather than in the rich experiences, processes, and evolutions of cities. Over 50% of the world's population lives in cities and that number is expected to increase to 66% by 2050 with an additional 2.5 billion people. The most urbanized regions right now include areas of North America where 82% of the population lives in urban areas. The world's population, as the world's population continues to grow, urban areas are projected to gain 1.35 billion people by 2030, equivalent to the entire population growth estimated for that period. According to a Brookings Institution study entitled Towards a New Metropolis, The Opportunity to Rebuild America, by the year 2030, North America will need about 427 billion square feet of built space to accommodate these growth projections. According to this symposium's abstract, Toronto's Smart Growth Plan anticipates a population increase from 2.77 million to 3.64 million in less than 25 years, and a significant portion of which will occur as densification in already established urban areas. These massive projections of urban growth and growing need for cities to address complex issues will require the knowledge and skills of a broad array of experts. Understanding a city as a part, as a part or as a city and designing it are two different things. Overemphasis over on design without adequate understanding of the urban severely limits the project's potential and reinforces the common misconception of urban design as big architecture. Even Rem Koolhaas humbles himself to the incredibly complex urban when he says architects are confronted by an arbitrary sequence of demands with parameter parameters they did not establish in countries they hardly know about issues they are only dimly aware of, expected to deal with problems that have proved intractable to brains vastly superior to their own. One of those issues include the existential threat of global climate change, which presents equally daunting challenges as sea levels threaten the viability of coastal cities all over the world. In the developing context, many of the poor live between and around planned developments in ad hoc settlements that lack infrastructure, open space, and basic amenities. Settlements often occur without permission on steep slopes or low-lying areas prone to flooding. And despite the precarious nature of these slums, communities have become more and more dense and even begun to push up against the edges of the formal city in this kind of dramatic juxtaposition. In the U.S., many of the same social, economic, and spatial segregations persist, only here, only there, now that I'm in Canada, uh, in the form of federally funded public housing. Urban design is not defined by scale, program, geography, or form. It is represented by a broad range of projects and values, as seen here by those selected over the years for Harvard's Green Prize in Urban Design. I teach a seminar every year called Cities by Design that surveys roughly 20 urban projects. Uh, last year, the projects were organized by op operational capacity, uh, revitalization and community development, large infrastructure and theme growth, public open space, uh, disaster relief and urban resilience, and urban conservation and adaptive reuse. This year, they are organized by scale, small incremental tactics, medium urban infrastructure, large metropolitan districts, and extra large regional intermediations. Urban projects can catalyze economic development, uh, job creation, and stabilize new centers for activity. They are coordinated, supported, and financed by various groups, including governments, private sector, NGOs, non-government organizations, community-based organizations, and urban activists in various configurations and combinations. No matter the project, there is always one question that defines the interplay of urban politics and urban design, and that is, who holds the power? In elite theory, business leaders control the public decision-making, and cities are hostage to capital. Capitalists 
uh, domination manifests itself in land use planning and provides a basis for land grabs and gentrification. Property developers are central figures in these urban growth machines. The Marxist view looks at this as cities experiencing the benefits of capital investment or deprivation by capital withdrawal. Because of local dependence on capital, politicians have little choice but to defer to the wishes of capitalists in making policies, often at the expense and well-being of urban residents. Politicians feel pressure to ensure a good development climate or a good business climate in order to attract business leaders to a locality. And from a political economy view, those with more political economy have more power to influence change. So these are sort of diagrams illustrating these, and each of these sort of looks at that different power structure. Um, so you see public and private, um, who's involved in a sort of conceptual level um, from sort of the federal, state, city, and local government perspective, and then a kind of a timeline of the planning, design, implementation, and outcomes of a given project. And this is conceptual and, and sort of generic, but meant for to illustrate that process. So the process, um, for sort of it, through elite theory is that private sector designs, finance, and implements projects with self-interested economic benefits, possible public benefits, and possible public harms. In the case of public harms, the community complains, the public sector establishes new law, code, or policy to mitigate the public harm, and business as usual resumes. Jerry Builders in the mid, mid to late 19th century New York built tenement housing to support rapidly industrializing center, um, but there were minimal standards and very few regulations. Clustering of tenants created unsanitary conditions and overcrowding led to legislation, although minimal, which stipulated basically one restroom for 20 people and a window in every room, or at least a window to a window, a window to a room that had a window. Um, that sort of counted. During this period of time, Jacob Rees assembled photographic documentation of the duality of the city. Up until now, the conditions of the poor had only been written in accounts such as Jacob Rees' own uh, Sunshine and Shadows of New York City Guide, which was published in 1869. Rees now used photography to, de to depict the poor as desperate, helpless, and an extreme lack of proper housing accommodations. Living arrangements and work were often combined in cramped, inhumane conditions, and poverty sometimes led to desperation and high levels of crime. Gotham Court was a model tenement built in 1850 that was condemned in 1880 and demolished in 1895, actually, after this um, book was published. Despite his good intentions, though, Reese's depictions were one-sided, only highlighting the destitution, with no reference to the incredible social resilience expressed by those who were able to survive and save money towards upward mobility. After the plumber and sanitary engineer model tenement competition of 1879, the dumbbell tenement became the standard. However, legislation through the building department was not retroactive to buildings that were already constructed and occupied. Also, the higher cost of new construction made construction less profitable, resulting in very little new construction and even more overcrowding. So despite the good intentions, this new rule actually had a negative effect on the poor. The first two decades of the 1900s marked the first time that the government became involved in the shaping of the city by shifting towards regulation that had not been seen up until this time. Up until now, regulations were only minimal and only came into play when, they needed to, when, when the need reached a scale that could not be ignored. An early example is the, 19, is the New York City zoning of 1916 in response to the construction of the 40-story 40 40 Equitable Life Building built a year before. I always find it really ironic that the, the name of the building is the Equitable Life Building and it's like inequitable in its assessment of you know, what it was doing with casting shadows. Um, but anyway. Uh, the challenge, let's see, the shadows cast on adjacent buildings as well as on the ground causing public uproar that resulted in the first form-based code that required setbacks and stepbacks to reduce the impact of shadows cast on, uh, by new construction. The challenge to the private control primarily focused to alleviate some social costs of urban capitalism and even still at the most basic level urban policies serve to identify, organize, and legitimate the interests of private capital rather than promote a social agenda. The next iteration of urban political power and development was expressed by public-private partnerships in the form of urban development regimes. 
Regime theory is essentially a fusion of the political economy theory and the pluralist theory, which I'll get to later in the, in the conversation, in the talk. Uh, based on the assumption that no single group can successfully hold all of the power, regimes are networks in the form of long-term coalitions based on mutual dependency and work towards common goals. Local politics matter, and who dominates the local level, at the local level affects the welfare of the urban citizen. Regime theory stresses the importance of building political coalitions and assumes local decision-making can change people's lives. Public policy is shaped depending on the structure of those with power, who they are, how well they work together, and how much power and influence they hold. It involves trust and balanced coordination among local business leaders, community leaders, and local politicians with oscillating leadership roles depending on the task at hand. In here, the process is essentially um, that a compelling case is made by the public or private sector for economic growth. An initial investment is made in the form of catalytic, catalytic infrastructure to jumpstart private sector growth. The private sector organizes, questions the capacity of the current regime, and defines the scope and purpose of their collaboration. They catalyze their new relationships around a common goal, hire professional experts, like you all are, designers, planners, economists, engineers, um, make public presentations, utilize uh, zoning, policy, and other legal tools to support the success of the project, and then es basically they establish and maintain long-term working relationships for future collaborations. It's important to note that the dominant power that business has requires an extraordinary effort by other groups to overcome the systematic bias towards business and the urban power network that exists within cities. The early forms of public-private partnership were clumsy and imprecise, to say the best, to say the least and the best. The mid-20th century introduced an era of big government programs that were designed to support and propel private development in cities. In 1948, the Massachusetts Department of Public Works unveiled a master plan for Boston's highways. According to the new plan, Interstate 93 would route straight through downtown on elevated supports, and the inner belt would be constructed quickly to connect Boston's inner boroughs without requiring a trip through busy Boston thoroughfares. This and other similar programs came in response to an urban exodus that was fueled again by the public sector support for suburbanization in the United States. Federal programs like the GI Bill that provided federally backed low interest home loans to returning soldiers resulted in widespread suburban sprawl like the kind seen here in Levittown. The Federal Highway Act of 1956 as a part of Roosevelt's Public Works New Deal legislation fueled federal highway construction that tore through inner city neighborhoods in the interest of high speed automotive movement between the suburbs and the central city locations. In 1953, this photo shows the initial phase of construction of the Central Artery Highway in Boston, where over 1,000 buildings were cleared to make way for the highway. The plan for the Inner Belt Freeway was to go through working class neighborhoods. This is again the part, the belt that was going to attach through, through, through to the artery. And it followed the, plan, the pattern of segregation, segregating the poor from the wealthy and cutting through areas that were already sort of devalued in terms of their real estate value. If fully in implemented, it would have displaced upwards of 5,000 people. And so a group of researchers, engineers, social scientists, and architects joined to create the Cambridge Citizens Against the Inner Belt. Citizens came together to advocate, wrote editorials, got more people on board, and organized an opposition across neighborhoods and across social strata. And in 1967, the state abandoned the highway proposal, redirecting federal funds to public transportation projects instead. Unfortunately, the mobilization that stopped most of the planned highways was not activated in time to stop the destructive impact of urban renewal that completely erased the West End neighborhood of downtown Boston. This time, the government action that led, that it was government action that led to significant unrest, organizing, and pushback. And this is what those areas look like today. And actually, on the right side, you'll see the Big Dig. So you probably are familiar with that project, where they basically you know, dug and buried the highway to try to repair that scar through the middle of the city. Um, 50 years later, it's kind of an OK place now. The happenings of the 1960s and 70s created an environment that was necessarily more responsive to local citizens. This was, it was now precedent that demanding things from the city 
and, have, and being heard was something that could be done by citizens. Pluralist theory suggests that all social groups have the potential to mo mobilize their own power resources. It stresses the importance of building political coalitions and assumes local decision making can change people's lives. Public policy is made within a general agreement of the merits of economic and social development programs. Focus on interaction of local, poli local political groupings um, and urban society sort of in its fractured conjuries of hundreds of small special interest groups with incompletely overlapping memberships, widely diffused power bases, and a multitude of techniques for exercising influence on decisions salient to them. Trust is based on reputation. Public, the public sort of makes heightened demands on state services, mobilization around symbolic issues, and the blocking of public programs by negatively affected groups. The risk of the, the last thing that I mentioned is sort of nimbyism, the not in my backyard where people sort of push everything away. The general process is compromise or gridlock um, on various goals. Um, and another risk is hyperpluralism, where there are too many competing interests and the result is no action or watered down results. In 1968, hundreds of demonstrators occupied a parking lot in Boston South End. Houses on the site had been recently demolished and their occupants displa displaced. Neighborhood activists created a temporary city they called Tent City. Between 100 and 400 people lived on the lot and they built tents with wooden, as sort of wooden shanties and put up signs welcoming the media to visit Tent City. Thanks to an attentive media, they won the public sympathy, sympathy for their cause and within four days the protesters left, although the tent uh, dwellers remained. Um, and it took 20 years, but the parking lot was eventually transformed into the tent city development that is now home to several hundred mixed income families and serves as one of the earliest examples of a mixed income development in the United States. 25% of the units are low income, 50% are moderate income, 25% are market rate. And tent city is one of the earliest examples of inclusionary zoning, although it's 75% lower moderate income as opposed to today's most progressive um, programs in the United States, at least, uh, inclusionary development policies, which are only upwards about 20% lower moderate income. Finally, there are low, lower income opportunity expansion regimes. Um, these regimes are more rare and are typically seen in the, the developing world context. These regimes involve, involve collaborations among state and federal governments with international non-government organizations and expert community-based organizations working towards community mobilization. Of this often includes empowerment um, through programs that uh, include community banking and uh, land tenure, the granting of land tenure, and it relies on a collaborative effort. Funding, funding sustainability depends on the stability of and the priorities of the centralized government and complex political coordinations. Success and scalability rely on reputation, skills, and influence of the expert community-based organizations and involves collaboration with other experts, universities, architects, engineers, and planners. The process here is essentially that a social issue is identified um, and projects are funded by a federal government or in collaboration with international NGOs like the World Bank. Analysis and data gathering is done in collaboration with universities or institutional non or international non-government organizations. Capable community-based organizations are identified, local, local communities are engaged, and collaboration happens among residents, local ex experts, and designers. Community mobilization happens and pilot projects are implemented. Universities, non-government organizations evaluate the impacts and adjust the program to improve the results. The Cody Bon Mekong Secure Housing Program was introduced in 2013 in Bangkok as a promising model for addressing existing informality. It is widely known for placing slum dwellers at the center of planning and financing of their housing improvements. There are four different types of upgrading under the Bon Mekong. Uh, On-site improvements with minimal adjustments to layouts and plot sizes, but security of land tenure. Reblocking where layouts of houses and roads are adjusted so that new sewers, drains, walkways, and roads can be conveniently installed. Reconstruction of existing settlements that are totally demolished and then rebuilt in place. And relocation of communities, ideally within a five kilometer uh, radius of their existing location. In Medellin, Colombia, the urban integral projects of so social urbanism 
uh, policy were developed. Building on previous and ongoing infrastructure projects, cross-sector teams engaged communities and developed projects in each area. Working relationships were established and maintained by community leaders from adjacent clusters on, on a governing board, contributing to long-term working relationships. Despite the successes of these and other programs to addressing the challenges of informality, it does not address the larger structural issues that prevent slum formation in the first place, nor does it adequately address the poorest and most vulnerable. Without greater po political stability and centralized commitment to the stability of programs like this, there is no guarantee for the long-term viability nor the capacity to achieve scale necessary to eradicate these kinds of slums. Okay, now the project that I'm gonna get into. Um, so this is a, a project that I worked on um, and I was the lead planner and urban designer when I was working at Sasaki before I left to join um, Harvard. Um, and it's, I think, a really um, important example of uh, the sort of the urban um, uh, pro-growth, pro-development, but also middle-class opportunity regime, which is one of the structures I didn't talk about, but this is um, sort of a regime situation. So I'm going to spend the remainder of the time talking about this project. Uptown Cincinnati uh, is an environment that can be characterized as having limited access to public open space, challenging pedestrian connections, undefined street edges and lack of public realm amenities, lack of community investment in the form of residential infill and neighborhood connectivity, high levels of vehicle dependence and neighborhood traffic impacts, difficulty accessing and navigating, and no unified identity among the institutions uh, and the neighborhoods of Uptown. Uptown is also the second largest job center in Cincinnati after downtown, providing more than 50,000 jobs, $1.4 billion in salaries, and $3 million in annual economic impact. In May 2012, the University of Cincinnati's Economic Center published an ep economic impact study in support of a new $102 million interchange. The report promised that the interchange would improve access and wayfinding, enhance economic development, and reduce travel times. Less than a year later, in January 2013, the state allocated $2.4 million to move ahead with the design of the new interchange, and the Ohio Department of Transportation obtained 150 land parcels for the road project. And in many cases, this would be the end of the story, the project would be funded, the project would be built, and we would see what we got. The economic impact analysis would suffice um, to ensure that funding of the construction would proceed without a deeper understanding of the physical and social implications of the project's growth and the projected growth. While economic considerations are hugely important and will be, continue to be primary motivators for large infrastructural projects, equally important are the direct impacts that these projects will have on co the communities that surround them. In this project, there are essentially three narratives from the perspective of the city, the institutions, and the neighborhoods. By layering the regional transportation and economic development benefits with an understanding of local, physical, and culturally relevant issues, this project illustrates the added value that comes from a place-based, stakeholder-led visioning process. The process was only possible because we had a, a sort of um, enlightened client uh, the Uptown Consortium, um, who decided that the, there would be a broad cross-sector uh, representation um, on the steering committee. So the Uptown Consortium is a consortium of the hospitals, the University of Cincinnati, the large institutions in Uptown, uh, and they essentially decided that the, the local representatives of the six neighborhoods surrounding would be equal parties um, in the steering committee. Um, as, ve as well as inviting in local businesses, uh, the planning department, and the city of Cincinnati um, in the form of the vice mayor, who was the co-chair. The city's interests in the study surround roughly 670 acres of vacant or underutilized land in Uptown, 150, 115 of those acres directly adjacent to the Martin Luther King Corridor, which is the east-west connection which would be enhanced by the new interchange. This was also an opportunity for the north-south connector, Reading Road, um, the only, only major arterial road connecting this part of Uptown directly to the heart of downtown. 
For the city, this was an opportunity to reassess the existing physical environment, reimagine vacant and underutilized land, and make strong physical and programmatic connections between uptown and downtown. The institutions, for the institutions, this was an opportunity to improve their identity and wayfinding and to spur economic development by taking on specific public realm improvements through targeted streetscapes, new open spaces, and a foundation for an innovative ecosystem of development, and creating a strong place-based identity both as a medical district and for the urban neighborhoods. So then the question is, what's in it for the neighborhoods? Um, at the start, the neighborhoods uh, had very little interest in this project um, because there was no obvious benefit for them. Um, what you're looking at uh, in those graphs are basically an assessment in a quarter mile radius of the proportion of surface parking to residential land area. So you essentially have a one-to-one -one surface parking to residential land. Um, and this is in an area where you have 50 to 75 percent mostly uh, families without access to a vehicle. So there are people who are living in this sort of parking lot that don't drive, and we're asking them to um, get excited to come talk about a new interchange that's going to increase traffic, but we're going to figure out a way to make it awesome, right? Uh, so the neighborhood associations were initially reluctant to join the committee um, with feelings of ambivalence at best and deep suspicion at worst. Um, so before we started, we had sort of focus groups where we had conversations with each, uh, each stakeholder, um, each member of the steering committee individually. Um, we asked very pointed questions and we promised anonymity so that anything that they said wouldn't be attributed, but it would be brought back to the larger conversation. Uh, and there was general sort of consensus on a few of these issues listed here. There was a deep-seated mistrust of the institutions by the communities. Uh, there was a neglected and crumbling physical environment, and there was a mismatch between the needs of the community and the actions of the consortium. We originally, con we were actually originally contracted to look at, um, to do a traffic study and tell them how many lanes they should add and kind of what that street design might look like. That was our contract. Um, so, this is the, so this is the nature of urban design. You come in with a sort of scope, um, and you, through the process, discover that that scope isn't exactly right because you discover all of these different embedded interests and issues that need to be taken on through this process. So this is the existing cross-section of uh, Martin Luther King. Um, you see the parking is a very sort of suburban uh, format in an urban uh, location. Um, and so we proposed three street options to begin, because that was what we were um, tasked to do. Uh, so the first was to um, introduce these new carriageways, and that was kind of to try to, to, to dampen the impact of traffic on the sidewalks and create a more pedestrian-friendly environment. Um, so essentially, you'd have slower moving traffic on the inner la lanes, uh, as well as on-street parking to kind of buffer from the neighborhoods. Uh, the hospitals were pretty concerned about this because um, you can imagine with all of the ambul ambulatory traffic trying to t take a turn, a left turn, they have to not only go across the street that they're on, but essentially a parallel uh, second street to cross over. So we suggested, well, maybe we just do it on the neighborhood side to try to dampen the traffic impacts on the neighborhood side. Um, and then the third option uh, was what we were calling the Grand Boulevard, which essentially accepted the traffic increase. Um, uh, because it really was bearable. Um, Cincinnati is a, you know, they're not used to like worse than B level traffic, and this is like C level traffic. Um, with a center median to allow for pedestrians to have a, a better crossing experience. So the second thing that we did was we did a little bit of gaming. Um, and I don't know if you've uh, read um, James Corner's The Agency of Mapping. It's a, it's a great piece that talks about the use of mapping um, as a way to uh, explore new um, relationships and new interfaces that you don't necessarily get from just hitting export from GIS or just tracing over something you're looking, but actually embedding and, and selectively editing information. One of the strategies sort of involved in that that he talks about is gaming. Um, and so we essentially had uh, two groups. Each group was organized with a, a collection of um, the steering committee that represented a cross cut of the institutions and a cross cut of the neighborhoods. Um, and we gave them these playing pieces and we said, okay, 
you actually have less pieces than you need. So we didn't just give them a whole pile of new streets and new retail, but we said you have less pieces than you actually need. So you guys have to discuss your priorities, discuss what the compromise is going to be, and really get to the, the heart of what, this, what, this, what your vision is as a group collectively through negotiation. So what resulted was very, two very different schemes, but they had a lot of basic similarities. Both groups agreed that most of the housing should be focused within the existing neighborhoods and not along the corridor. Uh, and the institutional and research-oriented programs should focus along the two major arterial roads. So these look very different, but you can begin to glean some, some similarities uh, between them. Commercial spaces, spaces should cluster at major intersections, and the primary road improvements should be along uh, key streets that connect the main arterials into the neighborhood and into the front doors of the institutions that are deeper into the block. Establishing a new district identity, focusing residential rehab infill near neighborhood centers, and creating a, con a continuous urban street edge were essentially the consensus framework that the two groups came to. So along Martin Luther King, the strategy was to, in to reinforce three mixed-use gateway intersections sort of at these key cross-sections um, connecting into the neighborhood. And they selected the Grand Boulevard as their, pre as their preferred option. Um, to create sort of this new pedestrian friendly environment, this um, very urban environment. And what we found in the traffic study actually was that 65% of the traffic was generated by the institutions themselves. So they actually had the capacity to modify where that traffic moved through the city. Right now, people drive in, there's another highway on the other side of Martin Luther King, so people come from either the east or the west, depending on where they live. And they go to the parking garage next to the building that they work. So one of the things we suggested is that, collectively, you should find out where people live, where they're coming from, and give them a parking space on one or the other side of the district so that you basically free up the traffic in the major stretch where you want to inc increase pedestrian activity. Um, they also had uh, four existing shuttle services with ranging levels of service and efficiency. Um, I think the most interesting thing is that the average cost per ride uh, ranged from $0.96 cents per ride to $79.19 per ride based on efficiency and the need to connect these places but not having um, as many people connected. So we proposed a coordinated uptown shuttle service that would operate as a single uptown shuttle connecting all of the institutions um, as well as the neighborhood centers again, bringing people from the neighborhoods into the middle and vice versa. For Reading Road, which is the north-south road connector to downtown, which bisects an industrial zone, which you see in orange, um, we uh, proposed these new knowledge clusters. And that we were thinking about this as sort of a research and development um, innovation ecosystem. You have all of these research and medical institutions. And so how can they rethink their industrial corridor in a way that's appropriate to the types of uh, research and work that they're doing? And this is much like the idea of University Plaza near MIT, if anyone's familiar with um, Cambridge, um, where you have this sort of uh, research innovation ecosystem that's around here, in this case, one um, open space. In this case, we were thinking that that sort of thing could repeat all the way through at intervals through the, the industrial corridor connecting to downtown. So Cincinnati is known or has been known as the uh, Porkopolis of the West, also the Paris of the West and London of the West um, at different points in history. But the Porkopolis of the West because Procter & Gamble is in Cincinnati and that Procter & Gamble makes soap and soap used to be made out of pig fat, and so there were lots of pigs in Cincinnati at some point before anyone that I know that's alive was here. Um, but anyway, just like Chicago has the cows and um, Barron has the bears, uh, we have pigs. And I'm from Cincinnati, so that's, I can say we. Um, so one of the things I think, just as a side note, that you should never shy away from when you know the context well enough to is including some humor in these drawings because actually that drawing up there really it came at this amazing point in the presentation when we were it was getting really heated 
the, the uh, owner of the McDonald's franchise was really upset about the center median. Um, and he basically was like, I've just invested all of this money in my McDonald's and you're going to put a tree line median and no one's going to be able to take a left into my McDonald's and I'm going to go broke. And I'm like, yeah, but we'll figure it out. It's like almost at the intersection. We'll do like, we'll allow you turns. We'll like, we're trying to like get through it. And he's like so upset. And then he like looks up at this drawing and he's kind of a portly guy himself. And he goes, <laughs> are those pigs flying? It's like, bust out laughing. And then he was like, you know, all in all, this has been a great process. I think this is amazing. <laughs> really, that's a true story. So, you know, when you know the context well enough to insert a little humor, you might not know you're going to need it, but at times you might need it. So we also did um, a market study. We worked with an, an economic firm, RCLCO. Um, they did a market study, and market studies are really useful for developers when calculating pro formas. They're helpful for cities when rezoning. They're helpful for um, institutions when they're making a case for a new interchange, right? Um, but in the hands of the public, it looks the way it looks probably, at least to me, which is like a lot of stuff I can't really put together in one sort of um, coherent and useful way in my own head. So we worked with them to try to get to the essence um, of what their study was all about so that we could then uh, use our sort of communication skills to, to use it to benefit the, the um, sort of knowledge of, the, of our client and the decision-making capacity. Um, this diagram, as simple as it is, to me is uh, one of the most important diagrams I feel that I did in this project. It's pretty simple, right? Like neighborhood centers, five, ten minute walk circle, like there's the institutions, there's the you know industrial corridor. But you recall the neighborhoods really weren't that excited to be a part of this. One of the things that they were, were really focused on was trying to uh, reinvigorate their neighborhood centers, which were sort of um, declining over many years. So they had all of these com community development block grants and all of these different sort of programs that they were trying to um, get people to move back into their commercial space. One of the things they were concerned about was that this new uh, interchange was going to bring development along the east-west corridor of Martin Luther King and draw people out of that, um, that demand that they were trying to seek. Uh, what we found with the market study actually was that there was 870,000 square feet of demand for over 1 million square feet of actual space. So actually, no matter how hard they tried, there was never any way that they were going to occupy all of those retail spaces that were vacant. But what we also found was that there was about 2 million square feet of, of potential capture of unmet demand over the next 10 years of residential development potential. And so what we said was, okay, all of the residential market potential, let's agree that we will focus that energy around those neighborhood centers so that we can add more people around the commercial centers which are going to bring up the sort of patronage and bring up that demand of the retail. And everyone said, that's great. The institution said, yeah, that's great. We don't want to be residential developers anyway. Um, what the institutions have been doing, though, is basically buying up these kinds of homes for $50,000, $80,000, demolishing entire blocks, paving um, parking lots. You saw the parking ratio um, between uh, residents and, and parking and then sort of land banking until they need to expand their institution. And so what this did was it basically, I, I snuck it in. I mean, I, I knew what I, I, what I was thinking when I was doing this. I wanted to give the neighborhoods a piece of ammunition where we all as a steering committee agreed on something. All of the residential demand should be within these five, 10 minute walk circles. But what that means is that anytime an institution then wanted to expand and demolish any housing within those circles, the neighborhoods could say, no, we agreed that we want to increase the number of units, not demolish anything. The other thing that this did, though, was it demonstrated that for the most part, any development along MLK Boulevard wasn't going to impact their neighborhood centers anyway, because it was outside of that walk shed.
So this is where things got interesting again. So one of the larger institutions um, told us they wanted to have a, a private phone call uh, and, and talk about their 50-year plan. It's like, okay, okay. So we have this conference call. Um, and this is really grainy because I, because it was a video conference so they could see me, but I like took a picture with my phone because um, they wouldn't give it to us. It was all like, you know, confidential. Um, <laughs> so don't tell anybody I showed you this. But, um, but essentially we had gone through this whole process of saying we want this, you know, active urban street edge. We want an urban condition, not this sort of suburban format. And meanwhile, what you see in black are the existing surface parking lots they were proposing to tear down buildings and, in fact, a parking garage for more surface parking because they had done a survey of their patients who said they really want a parking lot that they can get out in front of the building in. And so they were like, we're serving you know, our, our client. This is, this is our customer. And we were like, no. <laughs> so we had to, again, we're like <clears throat> now getting beyond our scope pretty far. Um, so it was like back to the basics. We actually presented this in one of the next meetings. We said, okay, this is what suburban is, and this is what urban is. Um, and you know, you can read the, the differences, and you kind of know those things intuitively um, anyway. But what we also felt like we had to do was to like take even a further step from a you know, traffic study and like how many lanes do you add and begin to think about what is, the, what is the development capacity of the space that you have already along this corridor? Because we had never really talked about that. We just said, oh, you have this space you can develop. So we just quickly modeled this out and, um, and did the calculations, and we found that there was 6 million square feet of development capacity in the corridor itself in underutilized or vacant land without demolishing anything um, at a 2.5 FAR, floor area ratio, which you guys know floor area ratio, right? I don't have to describe that. Okay. Um, which is not very dense and, you know, because the blocks are deep, you can get four to five stories out of that with the parking decks behind, so it's kind of mid-rise. Um, but that's a heck of a lot of development potential that they weren't really thinking about. So what we tried to do was show that um, there was a way to improve bicycle connectivity, establish a unified identity. Those are the, you see the three gateways um, there. The knowledge clusters, the first two of that series of knowledge clusters. Um, the um, urban street edge, and again, the, the sort of focus on those intersections. Um, focusing the residential development in the neighborhoods, closer to the neighborhoods themselves. Uh, and then m multimodal sort of options, so both parking and um, public transportation options. So again, this is the existing conditions. Here's what that looks like. This was the new street design with that sort of new development within. And again, one of the institutions said, no, we don't want to show development on both sides of the street. We only want to show it on one side of the street, at least for the near term. We can say the like long range vision is to have it two sides. That's fine, but don't show it in the near term. So that gave us a moment to actually have a conversation about a sort of compromise and how can we leverage the fact that this single entity of the entire steering committee is going against what we've all agreed to. So now you, you're not really, you don't really have the power to do that, but you're the biggest dog in the room. So you kind of can just do that because it's your land. You can just not build on it. Um, so what we got them to agree to was to give up 20 feet of depth from the existing curb to into their parking lot along a quarter mile length. And if you do the calculation at a 2.5 FAR, that's about 150,000 square feet of developed building envelope potential that they agreed to give up along that length um, if we showed it as the longer term uh, scenario. So we were actually through that, in that moment, actually able to leverage it and get the land we actually needed to make this happen um, through that conversation. So again, this is that sort of full build out. This is that near term um, situation. So after nine months, we had six neighborhoods, six institutions, um, and 
eventually actually unanimous planning commission approval and these collaborative long-term working relationships that started in this very contentious way, but through the design process, um, they actually ended up uh, working well together. And this is what, again, that looks like today. The inter new interchange comes over here. Those are the institutions. You can see the neighborhoods and how the fabric has just been chopped out all the way up to the, the houses and sort of this sort of slightly industrial but pretty decaying um, fabric. And then the vision that we worked together to uh, really come to. Um, and everyone felt ownership of this because everything about this drawing was developed and came organically from the conversation. Actually, Myself and, and my uh, colleague that were working mostly on the design of this, um, we had other ideas initially. We had already like designed stuff, and you know I'm from Cincinnati, so I'm like I know what this should be. Uh, but through the process, it became clear that actually those ideas I had were not actually the right ideas, um, and they they derived from the the committee themselves. So this is a lot of words. So I'm just gonna like. Show it for a second, and then I'm going to walk you through the recommendations and where they are in the in the recommendations. Uh, so first, we suggested that they um, submit this vision for planning uh, planning commission approval. Now, if you recall, we were hired by the consortium. They're a private entity. There was a no bid contract. They just called up a local architect that does a lot of institutional buildings for them. They called us at Sasaki. We said, yeah, that'd be great, and we just did the project. So there's no really legal legally binding anything about this, except the fact that they own most of the land so they can kind of do whatever they want. Um, but they were so excited about it, and there was so much community support that came from the process that they submitted it to the Planning Commission for adoption, um, which it was adopted with unanimous approval. You hope for consensus. Unanimity is like kind of amazing. Um, we also suggested that they begin acquiring and assembling parcels because if they wanted to have control over what was going to happen, they had to actually have control over what was going to happen. Uh, and so they've already bought um, more than 100 uh, parcels along the corridor in addition to the ones they already own. And of course, there's the question of gentrification and displacement. So how does this new development impact the communities that are there? Um, they're mostly communities of color, mostly disenfranchised. Again, most of them without access to vehicle. That's an economic situation, not a choice, in, uh, especially in uptown Cincinnati. Um, and so one of the institutions actually created um, a $35,000 uh, home improvement grant that they gave to existing residents all you need to do is apply and be a, a homeowner. Um, and if you remain in your home for five years after spending that money on improving your home, it's completely forgiven. So they, the institutions then start investing in the neighborhoods um, in real organic um, and meaningful ways to the existing community. So, you know, when you talk about the range of like the elites running things in the sort of pure market or like, you know, the like, government running things, there's a sort of a spectrum here that has a range of risk and control. Um, what we were suggesting was that our client really be in this range of public-private but more catalytic development entity because even though there was this two million square feet of residential demand, it wasn't going to happen. Developers, you know, if they already thought that, they would have already done something, right? So the, the market had to be proven. So what actually happened was on medical institutional land that had been cleared years before of, of the re residents that were there, the institutions actually broke, de developed, designed, financed, and broke ground on the first market rate housing in one of these neighborhoods since 1990. Um, and I don't know if you recognize the heads of the people, but those are some of the people that were in the picture around the table uh, when we were um, doing our work session and they're now working together to do the first phase of proving the residential market. Um, it's a modest start, but all of the units sold immediately and they're already into the second, third, fourth phases of doing these projects because they know it's really profitable. Um, and that will eventually catalyze the private sector. Um, again, the phasing plan, if you look at the left, those parcels are at those gateways. Uh, those also happen to be controlled by the institutions today. They didn't have to acquire any land for those. Uh, and the one that is closest to the highway interchange 
um, as of actually January, just um, a, a month and a half ago, um, there's now been uh, a proposal made that um, will uh, likely be developed um, in conjunction with the consortium. Um, actually, the, the, the lead architects that brought us on were the architects for the developer. Uh, and this is going to be a project that really sets the stage and sets the quality of development that we are looking for along this. And it's not, you know, it's not star architect architecture, but it's it's beautiful, it's thoughtful, um, it's it is appropriate in scale, and um, and it has a sort of porosity along the, the street, which is important for an urban area. So the Uptown Consortium and its board of directors have now this unprecedented opportunity to lead the implementation of this transformative vision. Um, but it's going to take a concerted effort. It's going to take them embedding the values and the ideas that came through that process into their own strategic agendas um, and uh, in order to guide their decision making. So in conclusion, the role of urban design should not remain limited to organizing vistas of constructed artifacts defined by space, proximity, perception, order, and sequence. It should also consider the political geography of contested territories, balancing tensions between public and private, among various political agendas and between humans and nature, and in the end be a principled process bringing a diversity of publics together to shape a just public realm. Urban design should be bold. Urban designers should be bold visionaries, contributing to long-term form-giving developments. They should be pragmatic te technocrats, urban designers should be, understanding and working within the political system to promote health, equity, safety, and the public good, and coordinators of complexity, enabling new and hybrid processes grounded in cause, pertinent to human values, and driven by purpose, not by discipline. Urban design operates on a continuum, continuum of expertise with a comprehensive, although not exhaustive, understanding of the simultaneity of complex systems at multiple scales. Therefore, the ability to understand and communicate with politicians, developers, and the public is essential to achieving meaningful, inspiring, and lasting urban design outcomes. The definition of urban design is, and its operational capacity is still up for debate, even at Harvard. I don't agree with everyone in my department, and they don't agree with me, but we all agree that we're interested in things that are important. I hope that's the same here. We can all <laughs> agree to disagree. Um, the definition of urban design and its capacity is up for debate. However, the fact that it remains an incompletely theorized field may actually be one of its central assets, allowing it to be more adaptive and responsive to the inherent complexities and uncertainty in cities. The urban designer is uniquely equipped as an initiator, mediator, negotiator, synthesizer, um, and essentially sort of the captain of urban systems into a coherent vision uh, where it's at the same time clear and compelling and still elastic enough to accommodate variation and change. Great urban design exists simultaneously as conceptual and tactile, responsive and productive, process-oriented and visionary. It maneuvers between the arenas of planning and design with a unique capacity to push back on and fundamentally change both. Thank you. <laughs>